My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Green Mountain Care Board, and I'm going to walk through the list of participants that I show on my screen um, that are not members of the board so that Abigail Connolly can um, record them for the public record. Abigail, are you uh, all set? Yes, Kevin. Okay. So every other time I saw, saw the whole number, now I'm just seeing the beginning of the number, so let me figure this out here. So the first number with the last four digits, 4191. Devin Green from Buzz. Welcome, Devin. The next one is 2505. Jennifer Collins, TV and Medical Center. Okay, the next one is 9997. Nine 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 seven. With an area code of two oh two if that helps the person. It's Amy brought up from one care. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um six three seven six. It's Mort Wasserman. Welcome, Mort. Uh nine zero six nine. Vicky Loner, one care. Welcome, Vicki. 0043. Becky Lewandowski with DRM. Welcome, Becky. 4002. It's Melissa Miles with the Green Mountain Care Board. Oh. Hi, Melissa. Um, 0193. Hey, it's uh, Jeff Batista, State Auditor's Office. Welcome, Jeff. Um, 5058. Susan from MVP. Welcome, Susan. Um, Thanks, five Kevin. Eight, 5835. Abigail Connolly. Oh, tricking us by using that number. <laughs> okay, 1824. Katie Jickling, VT Bigger. Thank you, Katie. Um, 1970, I believe that's the office. Yep, it's Janine. I'm at 144 State, and there are no members of the public present at this time. Okay, 8267. Lucy Guerin, DRM. Welcome, Lucy. Thank you. Um, 3212. Kathy Mahoney from the Advisory Council. Welcome, Kathy. 5817. Jill Guerin from BMS. Welcome, Jill. Hi. 9806. Mike Fisher, healthcare advocate. Welcome, Mike. Okay, Abigail, the next ones are actually listed by name. I have Susan Aronoff, Orca Media, Paul Ravelin, and Carol Stone. Is there anyone who I did not call off? Um, Don Bugby's here from Northwestern Medical Center. Thank Julia you. Julia Shaw, the healthcare advocate. Thank you, Julia. Sarah Barry, One Care. Thank you, Sarah. Are you good, Abigail? Yes, thank you. Okay. So with that, um, I'm going to commence the meeting and turn it over to Susan Barrett for the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I have really just logistic announcements for folks and scheduling announcements. Our meetings for the month of April are going to be quite fluid. Uh, we will follow all um, rules and, and the law of the open meeting law in terms of um, noticing these meetings. but. You'll see on our uh, website, we have our 
monthly um, press release for the month of April and, and the meetings after today are TBD. With that, I do want to encourage everyone to check our website under meetings 2020 and you will see the agenda listed for those meetings when they are um, decided upon. We, we just are responding, as you can imagine, to many things um, at different times and need to have that flexibility. Kevin, do you have anything you want to add on that or? No. Okay. Um, so in also in terms of logistics for today's meeting and meetings going forward, uh, all of the materials are listed on our website, again, under the meeting section, and then go to 2020 meetings, and you'll see the agendas as well as the slides. Uh, we're encouraging anyone presenting to make sure that they're, they're um, announcing which page number they are on on the slides. I, I reminded Elena of that earlier, so hopefully that will make it easier to follow along. If you have any questions about where to find the materials, please reach out to Abigail Conley, and her website is abigail.conley at vermont.gov, I believe. That's right. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was just to, to thank all those folks out on the front lines. We have a lot of the people in this, uh, on this line who are representing um, healthcare workers, and I just wanted to thank all of them as well as the many other people who are uh, getting us through this crisis. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 25th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Mike Barber, are you on the line? I am. If you could call the roll. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Yusufer? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Holmes? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you. So at this point, we're going to turn it over to Elena to um, talk about uh, the fiscal year 20 ACL budget. Elena. Great. Thank you. Um, so Elena Barabi, Director of Value-Based Programs and ACO Regulation. Um, so you should all be able to see the presentation um, that I've shared. If you can't, uh, just let me know if something happens along the way. Um, so we are on the second page. Uh, so the goals for today are to review OneCare's uh, request for operational relief that was submitted in the letter to the board on March 26, 2020, around their 2020 budget order um, or and their 2020 budget order given COVID-19 and concerns around hospital solvency. So a large part of OneCare's budget is built on the hospital dues, approximately 26.5 million or 46% of their non-claims expenditures. Um, so that means kind of their population health management programs, as well as their administrative expense. So it's how they keep the lights on. Um, in addition, you know, hospital costs are preparing for the pandemic are mounting and they're foregoing, you know, a lot of revenue associated with postponed um, and non-elective, non-urgent uh, procedures. Um, and the result is rapidly declining days cash on hand and negative operating margins. And I think the board has seen that through, you know, a lot of the hospital data that's been coming in recently. Um, so if we assume, you know, 50% of net patient revenue loss, this means a corresponding loss of 115 million in operating margin each month to provide some context. And some of our hospitals have estimated um, upwards of 70% um, of revenue losses. So this is why it's really imperative that we kind of look at all of the funds flowing um, to the hospitals um, and just to make sure that, you know, we're not inhibiting um, the, our response as a state to COVID-19 with any of our uh, previously um, kind of determined regulatory uh, decisions. Okay. Uh, slide three. Um, so the one care request so we're going to dive right in. So the first request was for the value-based incentive fund. The request was to waive the withhold for the Medicare portion of the fund. So this is about 0.5% of AIPDP. 
Um, in their 2020 budget submitted last fall, this was an estimated amount of 8 point almost 4 million. Of this amount, 1.4 million, approximately 1.35, was for Medicare. Um, so these numbers are expected to change as attribution changes, but this is as it was submitted in the fall. Um, so it would be to waive any funds that they've collected for that provision um, thus far. So the rationale is that these funds could be immediately released back to the hospital to provide financial relief during the pandemic, and the Medicare agreement does not require them to withhold this money. Um, so the motion, if the board so chooses, and we can revisit these at the end if you'd like, is to amend OneCare's 2020 budget order by reducing the total VBIS amount by the projected Medicare amount withhold of 1.35198. 4 million provided that OneCare releases any funds already withheld back to the hospitals as expeditiously as possible. Um, so I don't know, Kevin, did you want to vote as we go or do you want to kind of come back after we've gone through the presentation? I think we can vote as we go, but we're going to have to open it up to uh, any public comment on any motion. Okay. Great. Do, does a board member wish to make a motion? I can make a motion. Um, this is Robin. I move to amend One Care's 2020 budget to reduce the total VBIF amount by the projected Medicare withhold amount of 1,351,984, provided that One Care releases any funds already withheld back to hospitals as soon as possible. I'll second it. So I'm going to open it up to public comment. Um, Vicki, would you like to uh, start it off? Sure, Kevin. Thank you. And thank you for the board. This will provide some immediate cash flow to the hospitals, and we're happy to um, return that um, after this vote board makes such a motion. I just wanted to clarify that um, the amount is slightly less than $1.3 million um, with the new attribution numbers that have come in. So what would that amount be? I can send it to you. It's roughly one point, I think it's 1.175, but I can get you that number if it's imperative for the vote. I, I have it. Uh, I can pull it up if you guys are interested. Okay, but our motion, so this is Robin. Uh, the 2020 budget order, however, I think uses the 1.35 million, right? Yeah, because that's the, that's why I included that amount because it correlates to what's in the budget order. If for your information, the the amount given current attribution is 1.1, 1 .1, like Vicky said, 1,109,979. So then I don't think we need to change the motion because the motion is to amend the budget order and the 1.3 is what's in the budget order. Yep. Agreed. Yeah, I think the motion is fine. I just want a clarification so that we know what, what exactly is going on. So. so with that, is there other public comment? This is Julia Shaw from the HCA. Yes, Julia. Um, the HCA, uh, thanks. The HCA uh, supports this motion given the current context of the COVID epidemic. Is there other public comment? Um, this is Susan Aronoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. And um, I understand the situation that we're in. I truly do. I just think that before the board votes on things, it would have been nice to put it out for a public comment period. Um, clearly, that's not um, um, being considered. Um, anyway. And I hope at the end of the meeting, I would like to follow up. Um, there's some data regarding One Care that should have been posted January 31st that hasn't been posted yet. So I'm asking now to um, have a chance at the end of the meeting to request that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Is there other public comment? Seeing and hearing none. Um, Council Barber, could you call the roll? Kevin? 
this yes. Is, this is Tom. I just had I just had a question, and um, uh, not on the motion necessarily, but just just if if either Elena or uh, can provide just a little brief, a few sentences as to the remaining seven million dollars under that uh, budget item and uh, what the revenue sources are for that. Yeah, so the remaining um, revenue sources are from the other payers, so Medicaid and, and the commercial payers. Um, so those were not within scope of this request, but um, we can talk about that later in the presentation. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? If not, uh, Council Barber? Uh, Member Holmes? Yes. Member Yusufer? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, Elena, back to you. Okay. Um, so moving to slide oops, four. Um, the next request is for additional data from CMMI. Uh, so OneCare is requesting weekly claims data. Uh, this isn't something that we can necessarily approve or provide, um, but this would allow OneCare to more proactively monitor and adjust their Medicare fixed payments. So data is currently six weeks in arrears. We support this request and um, we'll discuss it with CMMI during our weekly check-ins, which our next one is scheduled for tomorrow. So we've already added it to the agenda. Um, to see how we can facilitate uh, that need. Um, so no vote is required there. Uh, so the next request is to extend certain deadlines required to the 2020 budget order. The first one um, to discuss is budget order items 17 and 19. Um, they'd like to move this deadline to September 30th. Budget order 19 uh, originally stated that no later than April 30th, OneCare must provide a report on how its population health investments address cost and quality differences across health service areas as identified in OneCare's variation in care analysis. Um, number 19 uh, had a due date of July 31st, um, by which OneCare must submit to the board a prototype uh, for an ACO performance dashboard. And I won't read it in detail, um, but this is really just about getting uh, data submitted to um, to the Green Mountain Care Board in a way that is uh, like cost quality uh, health service area data that will allow us to kind of track and monitor um, how things are changing on the ground. Given, um, you know, staffing restrictions and one care staff that could otherwise work on this project, as well as Green Mountain Care Board staff, um, we've kind of articulated that we think this is a good idea. Um, so we would uh, motion to amend the budget order to um, replace the existing dates with September 30th. And I'll pause there if you have any questions. Are there questions from the board? Elena, I, this is Robin. I think my recollection was that our original, before all of this, when we were um, in a normal state, we were hoping to get the the guidance out around the dashboard. Um, I think in March or April. Is that is my recollection of that correct? What yes. we were shooting so for. That's what we were shooting for. We have not been able to complete that work because of um, contingency planning around COVID nineteen and the reduction in capacity at the Green Mountain Care Board in terms of staffing. So, um, you know, I think we would need some more time to complete that work in order to get one care, the guidance they needed um, to continue that. Great. That makes sense. I just wanted to, I was trying to remember what our original plan was. So thank you. Yes. Yes. So before I open it up to the public, uh, Robin, would you like to make a motion? Sure. I move to amend the 2020 budget order to revise condition 17 to change the date from April 30th to September 30th, 2020, and to revise condition 19 to replace the date um, of July 31st with September 30th, 2020. 
I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Um, at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public for any comment. This is Julia from the HCA. Again, we also support this change. Thank you, Julia. Other public comment? Does anybody from OneCare wish to make a comment on this motion? No, we just again thank the board for their consideration as um, the healthcare providers continue to work to deploy their efforts to COVID-19. Okay, is there any other public comment? Or is there any further board discussion? Seeing none, Council Barber, could you call the roll? Sure. Member Yusper? Yes. Member Pelham? Yes. Uh, Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, Elena. Okay. So with that, um, the next request was to amend the budget order language for budget order item 18. Uh, this was initially requiring one care and GMCB staff to develop um, a work plan to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, OneCare's population health investments, including analysis of how to scale those that are successful, sunset those that are not, and report on opportunities for sustainability. Um, OneCare in their recent letter uh, indicated that they would like to amend the language to refocus this effort around its core programs um, that are included in their program of payments annually. So this would um, kind of reduce the scope of this uh, budget order item to just include, you know, their care management program and then VBIF funding, uh, which, as we've seen before, is, is perhaps not going to be a primary focus um, given COVID-19. Um, and so we actually recommend maintaining the existing language. You know, if these programs do go away, then obviously it wouldn't make sense to evaluate them. But I think for the remaining programs, if there are any, it would be very helpful to understand the how they um, plan to understand the impact of those programs and, and why it is a good investment. Um, and I think there's enough room in this language to continue to work and figure out what the best way to uh, figure out, or sorry, to demonstrate um, an evaluation methodology. Um, and I think that's why we had some language in there about GMCV staff and one care working together. So um, with that, I will you know, I think we recommend no change, but um, we'll leave it up to you to discuss. So, Council Barber, am I correct that no motion would be required if uh, it uh, remains unchanged? That's correct. Okay, is there board discussion on this issue? Okay, I'm going to open it up to the public and uh, give one care the first opportunity to respond. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify the reason why we had asked for our core programs is it, we're trying to work with our network right now to understand which programs they themselves are able to sustain. Um, for example, reaching out um, and talking to the innovation grant participants to see if they need to be able to hit the pause button on some of those programs, not that the funding wouldn't continue, but the funding might be paused and then the evaluation picked up at a later date. So we wanted to have some recognition that some of these programs might need to be um, put on a pause approach, which will make the evaluation of their effectiveness um, very challenging, if not impossible for us in this current order. Okay, is there other discussion? This, this is Robin. Um, to me, like the original date just requires basically a work plan of the evaluation. So. I think that Elaine is right. It is flexible enough uh, to take into consideration the issues that Vicki has raised because, for example, your first item in the work plan is probably figuring out what you're going to continue and what you're going to pause. 
so um, so I I think that I, I totally hear what Vicki is saying that it doesn't make sense to evaluate programs that may need to be put on a pause but I think that uh, this is flexible enough to allow for that this is Jessica I agree with Robin particularly there's language in the original uh, uh, budget order that suggests there could be a relevant time frame for implementation and evaluation. So if things are put on pause, then that time frame becomes extended. This is really meant to say we're hoping that you'll start evaluating, you know, One Care Vermont will start evaluating um, their programmatic investments in population health, develop a, a work plan, figure out how we're going to measure outcomes. And so I think that work can continue even if the evaluation might be paused. The, the language allows for that. Thank you, Jess. Anybody else from the board? Anybody else from the public? Julia from the ATA. Again, we also support the staff recommendation uh, as Elena presented it. Thank you, Julia. Anyone else from the public? Hearing none, we'll keep going, Elena. Okay. Um, so we are now on slide eight or page eight. Uh, so the another extension of deadlines. This is for budget items, uh, budget order items. Excuse me, eight, nine, and thirteen from their current dates to May thirtieth. Um, so this is the first budget order item. I'll just summarize. Number eight is for One Care to come back and present their revised budget. Uh, this is as in previous years to come back and discuss final attribution, final payer contracts, etc. Um, number nine is, you know, correlated with eight. Just suggest that they should provide their supporting documentation two weeks prior to that presentation. And budget uh, order item number 13 is around the population health management programs. If they are not fully funded, uh, one care must submit a revised proposal. So uh, that would kind of go along with their uh, presentation on their revised budget. Um, so one care provided a rationale for each of the items that um, that we've articulated um, are necessary to discuss on the 15th, um, the way the, the budget order is currently written. You know, among these issues are particularly around contract negotiations, that these are being updated in light of COVID-19 to address some of the concerns with, um, you know, how to move forward with those contracts. Um, and then, you know, I think all the things that stem from that. So I think, you know, there is a, a good rationale for moving these dates. So we proposed actually moving the, you know, the presentation itself to June 3rd. May 30th is um, a Saturday, so I just moved it to the next Wednesday. Um, and then I think it would still be helpful to, in order to provide staff time to analyze any of the documents um, that will be used in the presentation, uh, you know, two weeks prior to that or two and a half weeks prior, so May 15th. Um, that's a Friday, uh, to provide that documentation for both 9 and 13. Um, so I'll pause there. So there would be a motion, I believe, necessary to amend the budget order. This is Robin. I have a question. Um, I wonder about, instead of having a date certain, perhaps delegating the date to either Kevin or somebody so that um, June 3rd to me feels pretty soon because basically if it gives a month I think for the budget and contract negotiations to get reworked out which may not really be realistic so instead of for example having to come back and then push out these dates again maybe it would make sense to delegate it the authority to the chair to set a date certain based on evolving circumstances. I don't know what people think about that. Yeah, Rob, this is Maureen. I'll add to that as well. Um, that was the one thing I had written down uh, also about whether May 30th was going to be um, realistic to get the information that really would happen during the year, particularly for the hospital dues and the hospital risk pieces. Um, that said, you know, there are a couple options of ways to do it. We know that a budget is not accurate. It's, it's something that was put forward at a point in time and that may change. So, you know, another option is to lock down on a budget date 
and then come back and revisit this, um, whether it's monthly or, or, or only if it changes to give some flexibility there too. So just throwing out, you know, there's two different options rather than keeping a moving target out there, maybe aligning on a date and understanding that, you know, there may be changes to the budget as we've seen in the past as well. Other board comments or questions? This is Jessica. I would support either approach uh, that Maureen just outlined. I have more of a question. I'm just wondering in terms of, of you know, this is a very volatile environment. And, you know, going back and looking at the uh, population health budget, there were some items that got some substantial increases year over year. Um, you know, the primary prevention, I think, which is mostly rise from uh, went from 707,000 up to 1.1 million. The specialist program went from 605,000 up to 3.1 million. And I'm just, I'm just wondering how in this whole process, whether or not, uh, those, um, budget allocations are sacred or, um, will, folks look to be looking for savings possibly within them or redirecting those budget items. Like when this budget was done, um, the, you know, the specialist uh, uh, allocation and the increase in Rise Vermont made sense, but it might be uh, more prudent at this point in time to redirect some of those funds generally to the area where they were, where, where they were directed, which is primary care and specialist care. Um, not necessarily the hospitals, um, but to use that money to uh, um, support um, primary care, the survival of, of, of these entities out there, many of which are as stressed as hospitals. So I, I'm not I'm not quite sure how all this fits together, but I I worry that if we move something down the road to June 3rd or May or late May or June, that these contracts are already in place, um, and and the opportunity for savings in those areas. Um, um, can't be had. And um, I, I don't know if this is something that we're, you know, one care might put the contract negotiations for these items if they haven't already been executed on hold until um, we get the work plan that uh, uh, we, t we talked about in the, in the last motion. Can I add something? So I think there's another recommendation uh, later in the presentation that could synthesize some of these concerns. Um, and I think, you know, we'll be asking just to provide some foreshadowing, one care to come back uh, before this June 3rd deadline or whatever it needs to look like um, to talk about how their budget um, might be changing in order to respond to COVID-19, you know, before that's final. Um, we just have to figure out how to have that conversation. It might require confidentiality um, since it is contract negotiations. But I just wanted to kind of let you know that there is another opportunity to um, that we're recommending in addition to the budget order that's separate from this um, yeah. that, that could serve as an opportunity to address those concerns. Yeah. I, I did see that, Elena. I'm just making the point that, you know, those opportunities um, are lost if the contracts are executed between now and 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 that later date. And and uh, so, you know, I'm making that as a point that uh, um, that that the world as we look at it right now uh, could be different um, than the opportunities down the road because the contracts have been signed and the money's been committed. Um, and so I'm I'm just hoping that. Uh, you know, these contracts won't necessarily be signed um, until we've had a chance to kind of see the whole picture, full picture again as to, you know, what might be cut and what may not be cut and and where what is being cut is going to be directed. Does any board member wish to make a motion at this time? I can, but I wonder if we want to talk about that Maureen's approach versus kind of. I also letting... wonder whether we want to give um, give one care a chance to respond to both options. Um, 
Vicki, are you prepared to uh, respond? Um, Kevin, could you just give me a rundown of what the two potential options were that are on the table right now? So, so you want me to give a crack at it, Kevin, or you want to do it? <laughs> Go ahead, Maureen. <laughs> um, I think one option is, is moving the date um, as, as far as when the, this would be required by from instead of making it um, May 30th, have it more fluid between a decision between Kevin and Elena, our team and your team to determine when you'd have that information locked down more. The other option is it's a budget put it together, and should things change, keeping us up to speed, particularly on things like um, the hospital the hospital payments, the hospital risk, uh, you know, as things evolve, you may have more information on those things that would be different from the budget. So I think it was trying to say, do, we, do you feel comfortable locking in to May 30th and then just communicating a change, or do you think you would like to extend that date? Or there could even be a hybrid motion that would allow for um, the extension of the dates um, and granting the chair the authority to extend those dates um, with consultation with staff and uh, one care if necessary. So there's really like three different options that could be out there, Vicki. And great, um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, Flexibility. I would say right now things are very fluid um, and we're trying to provide as much certainty as we can and obviously trying to be responsive to the Green Mountain Care Board. I think as um, was mentioned earlier in the conversation, a lot of these contracts with payers are already locked in, so this is requiring us to open back up contract negotiations. Um, as well as making some amendments and having discussions, further discussions with the state as well. So we would certainly appreciate the flexibility to say um, in May whether or not this needed to indeed be moved out um, a bit further to be able to give people a more concrete um, look into what our budget um, will settle out to be for this, for this calendar year. Okay, is there other discussion from the board? Kevin, I actually like your hybrid approach where we move these dates, um, you know, according to the PowerPoint slide that we have in front of us, but add the additional phrase that delegates authority to you to um, remain flexible if that those dates need to be moved. Does someone wish to make that motion? Do you want to do it, Jess, or do you want me? <laughs> You're the motion maker. <laughs> <laughs> I move that we uh, revise Condition 8 to change the date from April 15th to June 3rd, 2020. Revise Condition 9 to replace the date from March 31st to May 15th, 2020, and revise Condition 13 to replace the March 31st date with May 15th, 2020, and move that we delegate authority to Chair Mullen to further extend the deadline if needed uh, due to COVID-related uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Second. Okay, is there discussion from the board? I guess I'd like to ask. Uh, I, I like this this motion of all of, of the three options. I guess that are out there. I would just like to ask uh, uh, one care. Ask Vicky, what contracts have not been signed? Uh, she may not know that right now, but um, but she may know it. And I'm just curious as to what what of these may not have been committed to contract already. So um, I can answer that. The only uh, contract right now that really is um, still looking to be finalized is our Blue Cross Blue Shield primary contract. Uh, we are hopefully inking the MVP soon, so that's, I guess, not quite signed either. Um, our program of payments 
which includes all these core programs, are already committed. So it will require us to change those program or payments with any of our providers to make those changes. So, for example, the specialist, um, the $3.1 million in the specialist uh, 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 pr program, that money yeah. is already contractually committed. Yeah, so what we do is every year before we send out provider contracts, we put in it what those program of payments are, so the 325 PHM payments, the value-based incentive fund, care coordination. Um, the only exception is like the innovation funds. That's that's more of a rolling program. And I'll have to look into what exactly is in that specialist fund because the dollar amount seems high. So I just need to be able to verify what's, what's committed to that. Um. Thank you. I, I, I guess, you know, given that, I um, I can support, you know, the, the motion. But, you know, if that specialist money has not been committed, um, uh, I would I would hope that, that those opportunities would be left open for the chair to consider this in an overall sense, in an overall package, so that, you know, under these trying times, we're pushing the money to where it's most needed. Yeah. Well, and just to be clear, I think the motion allows Kevin to change the dates. He is not on his own deciding the budget. So that will come back to us when the date gets yep. scheduled. No, I, I understand that, Robin. I, I, I ju I'm just making the point that, it, you know, if, if, if that contrast gets signed between now and, you know, uh, the, the end date, um, and, you know, second guessing says it shouldn't have been signed, the money might have been better spent somewhere else rather on a, a vastly expanded program um, that, uh, you know, um, prudent minds kind of, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> um, don't, don't let that happen. I have full faith in the chair to, uh, to uh, do, you know, to, um, to, to, to execute this. So just to clarify again, though, the motion isn't to uh, empower the chair to uh, prevent any actions. It's about uh, working with um, the dates on on yep. these deadlines. So yep. um, no, I I understand that, Kevin. I, I just you know I just want to make the point, um, and I understand it's just uh, relative to the date, but. Um, uh, and I wouldn't want to hold this process up to wait for a more perfect um, motion. So I'll support this one, but I understand it's about the dates. But I hope that one care um, is uh, um, tempered in terms of executing, you know, future contracts until this issue is fully resolved and we know where their programs are going for the entire year. Well, I think one care like the rest of the world realizes that the world changed and that we all have to uh, rethink everything. So is there other board comment? If not, I'll open it up to the public for, for public comment and uh, open it uh, first to uh, one care if they wish to make any, any statement. No, I think I'm all set. Um, I just, want to emphasize, obviously, um, the, the budget's really fluid right now. We're being very conscientious of where dollars are spent. We're being conscientious about where dues um, are being held and making sure that we're providing as much relief to providers as possible during these times. Thank you very much, Vicki. Very trying times. Other members of the public? If not, Council Barber, would you like to call the roll? Sure. Member Pelham? Yes. Member Yusufer? Yes. Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. 
Okay, Elena. Okay. We're moving to uh, slide 11. Uh, so that brings us back. So April 15th was the original deadline uh, or the date scheduled for one chair's presentation on their revised budget, which was we just discussed. Um, so while one chair may not have the appropriate data and information to present a final revised budget by the 15th, it is imperative that the board grasp how one chair's budget and programs affect hospitals' abilities to respond to COVID-19 and their solvency. So these dues, you know, I think we've all, we're kind of alluding to this in our previous um, discussion. And so, you know, the staff recommends that one care to propose an estimated revised budget, even if in spirit, um, on or before April 15th. And so, you know, I think we can talk about what that is. Maybe it's not in quantitative terms. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot still fluid and in motion, but, um, you know, we can talk about, now I'm on slide 12, we can talk about what should be in that presentation. This, you know, we've outlined a series of questions that might be helpful to consider. Um, so how does One Care see its role in the state's response to COVID-19? Which of One Care's programs, if any, are critical to hospitals and communities' abilities to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and how? Which programs are not critical and might be eliminated or downsized during this pandemic? How is One Care evaluating revisions to its 2020 budget? to support the state's response to COVID-19, and in particular, to support hospitals and other providers' solvency, including independent providers. Uh, in doing so, staff recommend that one care also comment on three of the budget orders, um, items, conditions, excuse me, uh, number 10, 12, and 16. So 10 is about the administrative expense ratio. So how did, you know, we, how do we expect the revised budget, you know, even if this isn't final to affect, you know, the administrative expense ratio, if it's too soon to tell, we can have this conversation at a later date. Um, you know, One Care has $4 million mm -hmm. in reserve. You know, how does One Care anticipate using these funds? Could it be used to um, help engage hospitals um, and provide some relief? Um, does One Care have other value-based incentive funds that could be freed up? So to Tom, your earlier point, you know, there is still uh, value-based incentive fund outside of Medicare dollars from commercial and Medicaid uh, that, that maybe there are some opportunity there. But as Vicki Lohner has been discussing, those contracts are still being negotiated. So, you know, we understand that these things might not be final, but it would be uh, very helpful, I think, to the board um, and its regulatory um, authority to understand how, you know, one cares budget will affect hospital um, hospital budgets and any to any information we can have as soon as we can have it can help us uh, facilitate, you know, those processes. Um, and then the last one is how is one care leveraging the increased reimbursement for telehealth in light of COVID-19? Um, you know, so I think that would be helpful to understand in the broader picture. Um, so I think I we proposed adding in condition 22 to quantify or kind of lay these questions out for one care to come back and discuss on April 15th. Um, I think we're certainly, you know, open if there are other ways the board would like to take this, but wanted to present it um, as a point of conversation. Uh, so I'll pause there. I'll go back to the previous slide, um, slide 12, so you can think about it. Okay, questions or comments from board members? So this is Jessica. Um, I think I just want to lay out there that I don't think we expect uh, a revised budget on April 15th, but I think the spirit of this recommendation from the staff and the proposed motion is to really get an understanding and a check-in from one care on the original date of April 15th when they were going to uh, present, you know, sort of an update on their budget. Uh, you know what? What is One Care's role in this in this COVID-19? What are the levers that One Care has to alleviate some of the financial burden on providers in the state? You know how is this going to affect their budgeting process uh, as they're evaluating revisions to it? What is the process? How are they prioritizing? What is the criteria that they're using to think about uh, re revisions to their budget in light of the pandemic? So that's the spirit of this language, I believe. Um, and so I'm curious what other board members would think about this. This is Robin. Can, the slide. Sorry, to just for the public, I, slide 13. Sorry, Elena. Uh, to Tom's earlier point, I think getting a check-in 
on April 15th would be important so that we can understand the landscape and what people are talking about in terms of the programs and the potential changes to the budget. I'm wondering if condition 22 needs to be this specific or whether it could simply be that no later than April 15th, they'll, pre they'll present to the board on their COVID-19 response, um, including information about potential program changes, but just sort of bump it up a level so that um, we get an update on whatever with whatever granularity is available at that time without having to have a budget order amended because some piece of it wasn't ready. Other board members? Hi, Kevin. Um, hey, so uh, I'm looking at the phrase here to support hospitals um, and other providers, and I presume solvency. And I presume um, other providers means uh, um, other than, uh, you know, includes primary, the primary care folks, which are the front door to the whole ACO approach. And, and so their survivability um, is important. And I would think um, that primary care providers associated with the hospital would have, and there's no easy route here, but an easier, relatively easier route being associated with a hospital um, uh, or at least most hospitals, uh, rather than being on their own. And so I'm just encouraging one care, you know, that as we head toward this April 15th um, date, uh, that uh, they reach out to um, uh, the independent primary care providers in some kind of organized way so that we can uh, get a window into uh, their solvency issues as well. So, Tom, as I'm reading it, it says, and in particular, to support hospitals and other provider solvency, including independent providers, which I think captures um, who you're talking about. Is there something that you think is missing from that? Um, no, I'm just, I'm just emphasize, emphasizing, the, trying to emphasize the point of having a kind of an organized reach out to these independent providers um, and uh, you know, so that that when we when when we get the view of the world from one care's perspective, uh, it's well grounded in, in what folks in the field are, are feeling out there. Okay, other board comments or questions? Yeah, no, I'm in agreement with what's been said. You know, I would point out April 15th is two weeks away, and, you know, I'm not sure anyone's going to be in the position to be able to really respond to what's going to happen with COVID-19. I mean, so it's this will also be fluid as far as, you know, what's going to happen, you know, what we would our expectations would be as far as I'm concerned. I agree with you, Maureen, but I also agree with the need to have information sooner rather than later as it relates to responses to the virus. No, I agree, too. So I'm just saying, you know, I think the expectation is, you know, whatever is done in two weeks, we're going to be figuring out as a state a lot of things as well. So I think it's just it's going to be adjusted, I'm sure, during the course of the year. And I did hear Elena mention confidentiality may be required on some uh, – aspects and I'm sure that Council Barber and the legal team could uh, work through that to uh, we certainly don't want to get in the way of any contracts with payers or anything else so yeah this is this is Mike if I could speak to that just for a second I mean we have a confidentiality process for written materials that are submitted to the board um, but we're talking here in this proposed condition 22 about a a presentation to the board and as you guys know the only way to have confidentiality in a in a setting like this is to go into executive session so um, which which is available for um, discussion of contracts uh, provided you guys make certain findings about um, premature public disclosure of that information but that's if you guys wanted information about that that's kind of how that would have to go Thank you, Mike. Other comments or questions from board members? Robin, do you want to take a crack at a motion? Yes, uh, I move. Is there pub uh, public comment? Public comment. Yeah, I was going to I was going to put the motion out first and then open it up to the public. 
Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Robin. I move that we add condition 22 to one cares 2020 budget order, which would read no later than April 15th, 2020. One care must prevent to the board on its role and response to COVID-19, including uh, information available about programs, program changes, uh, or potential revisions to their budget. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Maureen. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to the public for public uh, comment. Hi, this is Mort Wasserman. Uh, I think the specificity in what the staff had written in the original uh, action, which included member mentioning independent providers and which member Pelham specified is critical because in fact, that is an endangered large portion of primary care in this state. And I can tell you from informal context that visit volumes are way down and telehealth reimbursements, although they've been provided really in a heroic way, are not going to make up for that. And so I like <clears throat> the fact that in the action as reason originally suggested, it specified that portion of the healthcare infrastructure, namely independent practice. Other public comment? So this is Vicki, if I could just give some context and comment as well. Um, I do appreciate um, the opportunity to um, have a conversation with the Green Mountain Care Board on the 15th and let them know um, what levers we have within our own control, but obviously there are levers that um, have interdependencies and dependencies on the payers actually agreeing to some of our recommendations. I do believe that having that conversation on the 15th would be premature um, given where we're at with our negotiations. I certainly appreciate that we as the ACO are trying to do all we can to support all of our providers, um, including our independents, and that's part of the negotiations we're trying to have right now with the payers. Um, it's also dependent on things like delivery system reform funding, um, what's already been agreed to with um, the federal government in terms of where those dollars are allocated. So even if we make some decisions that we don't want to go forward with some programs, that's going to have to um, have some agreement by the federal government as well. So we can certainly talk to you on the 15th of what kind of processes we're going through. I don't think that we'll have definitive action on what things in our budget are going to change on the 15th. Um, also, just because we don't have a board meeting until two days after the 15th. So we won't even have had the opportunity to discuss this with our board. And I just want to point out that our board does have two independent providers on it. Um, and we have been really working actively through them to understand what the needs are for the independent practices. Thank you, Vicki. Other members of the public? Hi, Kevin. Mike Fisher here. Hi, Mike. So I appreciate this, uh, the, the spirit of this motion or um, this motion and the, and the board staff's work on, on this as well. Uh, and I think it all makes sense. I think I have a more basic comment or question to pose, and I want to do it carefully because I don't want to be misunderstood. Um, given the scale of what is in front of us, um, how do we appropriately balance the, uh, the all-pair model effort, what we've built so far, and, um, and uh, um, continuing with it with the 
tremendous need that's playing out from, you know, in our communities and, and from our providers. And, um, you know, with that in mind, I, you know, I don't know what we're going to learn from this year's demonstration year. Um, um, I think that, um, and, and maybe more than this year's, uh, I will uh, recognize, and, and, and I, I think it's important to recognize, I did hear UVM clearly say how important the prospective payments are at this time, given what's playing out uh, in, in the provider community. So that's uh, noteworthy and important. Um, but I, I end up with a much more basic question about how to run this year and balance, um, you know, uh, payments from hospitals to support one care in a, in a more basic way, uh, given the uh, tremendous need that the provider community is, is facing. And your point is uh, spot on, uh, Mike, and uh, basically, uh, We've begun conversations with all signers to the agreement to try to figure out what is the right step forward, realizing that this year is um, really an exogenous event, and there's a clause in the contract that uh, um, provides for those type of events to be considered. And these are the type of things that we're working through with all signers of the agreement to try to come up with. As you said, this year truly is not going to be a year that um, is going to give us the information that we had hoped from the all pair model. And so we ha we're gonna have to make changes and we're gonna have to move forward from there. And this is Vicki, Mike, I, I totally agree with you. Um, that's why we're having those discussions and really need to um, engage the federal government in this discussion. I think the important thing, as you mentioned, is all of our providers that are receiving the fixed payment are saying to us that's really valuable because it's predictable um, and it doesn't um, vary based on the volume. We also have independent providers that receive that payment as well. So we don't want to do anything to harm them in this process. So really trying to work with um, the federal government to assure that predictability still continues to occur. We also have various healthcare reform efforts such as SASH and Blueprint that are dependent on this initiative. So we just have to be very thoughtful about um, how we approach this year. Okay, is there other public comment? Robin, as the maker of the motion, are you um, satisfied that your motion uh, takes into account the different conversations that were just had, especially, uh, go ahead. So uh, given that the Vicky's board will not be meeting till April 17th. I think it would actually be more appropriate for us to hear from them at our meeting on April 22nd um, so that the One Care Board would have an opportunity to discuss uh, the various issues and that what we hear has been flown, flowed through that governance system. Um, and I appreciate Mort's comment about the specificity, but quite frankly, if the information isn't available, then what we end up needing to do is then amending the order again and again and again, which just is not practical. So um, I, too, share his concern and Tom's concern about hearing about impacts across the provider spectrum, including the independents. And so I'm sure that we will be asking questions about that at the meeting. Um, but I... Personally, I'm not comfortable with the specificity in a budget order. So, okay, Robin, I, I hear your motion is to amend by changing the date of your motion from April 15th to April 22nd. Is the seconder in agreement, and, and is that a friendly? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Further discussion from the board? 
Hearing none, uh, Council Barber. Member Yusufer? Yes. Member Pelham? Member Pelham? Tom, if you're muted, unmute yourself. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Member Holmes? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. Okay, Elena. Okay. Um, so now we are on slide 14 in the last slide. So, you know, next steps, we just wanted to revisit this, document today's board discussion and budget adjustments or budget order adjustments uh, in a letter to One Care. And then uh, just wanted to recognize uh, what Vicki was referencing earlier about, you know, engaging with our federal partners and I think with our other state partners. We're, as staff are continuing to review the all payer model agreement with our, you know, with all of these partners to explore potential impact of the epidemic on state's performance under the all payer model, um, as well as to think about, you know, its effects on cash flow to providers in this time of need. Um, and we can talk about that further as we learn more there. Um, and that is all I have today. So thank you. Thank you, Elena. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, um, and I'm Susan. I'm not forgetting you. I don't know if you wanted to make your comment now, or if you wanted to wait till after um, new and old business. Um, do you have a preference, Susan um, Ernoff? No, I can. Just, hi, this is Susan Ernoff. Um, so the information that I'd been looking for, which should have been up January 31st and wasn't up till like beginning of this week, is now up to quarter four for ACO data is you now posted. But I guess my general comment is, is I hope you include um, some public or other stakeholders in your discussions about um, going forward with the all-payer model or what impact the um, pandemic uh, would have on that. So some people who aren't parties to the contract would have an opportunity to have input in those decisions that impact us all. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Is there any old business to come before the board? This is Robin. I had a piece of old business from last week that I wanted to bring up. Go ahead. So uh, last week we approved some emergency certificate of need guidance under our existing statutory authority. Since that time, the legislature passed H 742, which allows us some additional flexibilities for COVID related projects. And so I wanted to raise the idea that we consider um, coming up with a short list of potential time-limited projects that we would uh, explicitly waive the need for CON review and approval. So um, the obvious sort of examples that came to my mind were um, the surge sites that hospitals and nursing homes are uh, currently planning for. I think as some people may have um, heard or seen in the news, uh, the CMS has just, I think it was yesterday, issued some waivers of uh, different Medicare rules which allow for hospitals to add additional beds off-site. Um, it would also allow nursing homes to use other at essentially at technically add beds by allowing for placement of patients off site uh, in order to make sure that they're um, appropriately giving people isolation for COVID related issues. Um, so I wanted to raise that idea to see if people were open to it. And if so, then um, I think perhaps I can work with Mike or another member of the legal team to come back next week with um, some guidance, which we would attempt to post as soon as possible so that we can get some public comment at the Wednesday meeting. I think it's an, it's, uh, an important thing, and uh, I'm certainly open to it. Um, during times of crisis, sometimes government has to get out of the way, and we certainly uh, want to make it as easy as possible 
as possible to create additional beds or anything else during this um, addressing of the uh, pandemic. So I'm open to it. Um, other board members? I'm open to it as well. Yeah, this is Jessica. I agree. A good effort. You okay, Tom? I have to push my unmute button. Yes, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, Robin, right. I'll, I'll ask you to work with um, Mike Barber and Donna Jerry and uh, Amarin to um, come forward with a proposal for the next meeting. Great. And I would certainly say that um, if – for any of our folks in the audience that if folks have concerns about that or if um, they have suggestions for what should be on the list, that if they could please submit those and maybe we could use, um, I, we always have the ability to do public comments. So I'm happy to have people send it to me, but it may be just easier to have it go through the usual channels, which is usually, I think, through our public comment button or whatever. That way we can be sure that folks have an ability to chime in in the meantime. That certainly um, makes sense. Would it help, this is Susan, would it help if we just did a special public comment period? Does that make sense? So people yeah. can just click on it? Yes, public comment period through, um, I don't know, what do you think, Tuesday morning? Yeah, I think so. And, and certainly, like, we can, Mike and I will work together and, like, ideally, uh, we have, we could maybe post something before the meeting on Wednesday, too, depending on uh, how much time and, and capacity we have to get it done. Yeah, I think this is Mike. Um, I think it probably will require some discussion with um, other agencies and who are juggling a lot of uh, things at the moment. So I'm just, I think Wednesday is a good, you know, goal, but I'm just kind of worried about whether we can get a list together in time for that. But we certainly will try. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that um, the CMS guidance for that, particularly for offsite facilities, requires state approval, which would be done through Dale in Vermont. So um, I think we would want to try and reach out to them uh, to, to just get a sense of what, if they know what their process is yet for that. Um, but certainly since, I mean, in my mind, it, if we, I'm not thinking that the list is necessarily going to be comprehensive, so we'll keep our, our guidance that we approved last week so we still have a quick turnaround process. And if we have to postpone it, we can postpone it, knowing that we have that uh, emergency guidance in place, but uh, uh, almost could be an aspirational date of next um, Wednesday, and We'll have to go from there. Sounds good. Does any member of the public wish to comment on that proposal at this time? Hearing none, is there other old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? So this is Robin again. I just had a, a question that I wanted to pose. Um, so since also we met last week, H681 passed, which made some modifications to the open meeting law, such as not requiring a physical location um, as if we were doing an, an online meeting and had ex accessible um phone numbers and things like that. And I think the, the other thing that caught my eye around that was that the roll call wouldn't have to be taken all the time, only if there wasn't a unanimous vote. So I was just curious, Mr. Chair, if you had thoughts about whether we were going to be moving in that direction now that H681 is <coughs> passed. I think it's pretty likely. But obviously, I would want to hear from other board members before doing that. Well, I think in particular, for me, the physical meeting location, since it's Janine or Jean that are that 
are basically putting, and we haven't had any public members coming anyway, but I think um, if we can dispense with that, especially given that we haven't had any public members, that in particular to me uh, seems desirable. Yes, and I also don't believe we've had any feedback that people believe that they've uh, lost their ability to have comment um, because of the Skype meeting. So um, I, I think that's an important point, Robin, that there's no point in putting anybody at risk. And um, it, it would make sense to me not to have a, a public location, but again, um, I'd like to hear from other board members to make sure that they're in agreement. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense to me as well. Um, yeah, this is Jessica. I would agree with any uh, movement that reduces public risk, reduces our staff risk. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree as well. I, I think uh, it's nice for Gina and Janine what they've been doing, but uh, to have people wandering, not wandering, but coming in and coming out of that building, you know, while it's their workspace is, is probably not a good idea. So um, um, I, I'm in agreement. Okay. So that change will be uh, made immediately, and uh, Abigail will uh, have that up on the site so that everybody knows that um, they need to either call in or to um, log in to Skype to um, participate at one of these meetings. And, and excuse me, Mr. Chair, um, Abigail uh, did that right after H681 passed proactively, but now it's reaffirmed by the board. That's the direction you want to go, and so that's already done. Thank you, Susan. Abigail's always a step ahead of us. That's right. Okay. Is there any other new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Second. Been, been moved and seconded to adjourn. Council Barber? Uh, Member Pellin? Yes. Member Lunge? Yes. Member Holmes? <coughs> yes. Member Eusper? Yes. Mr. Chair? Yes. So that will conclude our meeting. Everyone be safe. Um, practice good social distancing, wash your hands, and um, the sun is shining here in Rutland. I hope it's shining wherever you are today. Have a good rest of the day.